Um, I've been asked to do a short presentation, which should take about 10 minutes or so um, to uh, cover uh, some of the consequences of meningitis. Um, and it was a big brief I got given, um, but um, I, I shall try and do this justice for you, and I hope it's of interest. Um, so I'm a, I'm a consultant neurologist, um, and I'm a senior clinician scientist fellow, so I split my time between uh, the University of Liverpool and the NHR Health Protection Re Research Unit for Emerging Zoonotic Infection. So as you can imagine, we're very busy right now with a particular emerging and zoonotic infection, which is taking the world by storm. Um, and uh, I work at the Walton Centre, uh, and that's why I'm dressed like this and look slightly dishevelled because I've just run across from my clinic, uh, seeing people who've had meningitis and, and encephalitis and other brain infections. Uh, and then I do most of my research still back in Boston, uh, where I did my postdoc. Uh, and I, I'm a, I forget what I am for the Meningitis Research Foundation. I'm an, a, a, a clinical advisor or something. I help, I help support the advice line and, and some of the uh, documentation and I am the vice chair of the uh, uh, scientific panel of the Encephalitis Society, and my research is all around brain infections, uh, and those are the sorts of patients that I see for the most part. The brief I've been given is to cover the consequences of, of meningitis, um, which are just huge, and I've also been asked to cover the pathophysiology. So the brief is, is actually tougher than what I would normally do for medical students. Um, so I, I hope that, that what I've done is something that's, uh, that's of interest. I mean, you probably all know that the meninges are the coverings of the brain. Um, but it's, I just start with this because there's the dura, the arachnoid and the pia, and they, which three components together make the meninges. And of course, that's what gets inflamed in meningitis. And that's really important when we think about what the consequences are. Now, whilst the definition is in inflammation of the meninges, clearly we can't do a biopsy in almost most people. So we make the diagnosis seeing that there's inflammation or white cells in spinal fluid. Uh, but of course, the problem is, and what I'm going to try and demonstrate as we go through the clinical stuff uh, through to the diagnosis and the pathology and the, and the outcome is that this can be really hard for patients because you can have meningitis even without white cells in your spinal fluid. And you can even have bugs or pathogens in your spinal fluid without meningitis. So it can be complicated to make the diagnosis. Um, and what makes things even tougher is that many of the symptoms at onset can be very nonspecific. You know, we tell our medical students that patients have a fever. Well, not all patients do. We tell them they have a headache. Well, of course, headache's incredibly common and has got a long list of things that could cause it. Uh, we tell them how patients have an alteration in their mental state. But of course, that can be subtle. It doesn't have to mean that people are in a coma. Uh, we tell them they can have focal signs and, uh, and weakness uh, and seizures. But in fact, both of those can be missed. And even once uh, they do think about symptoms of meningitis, the range of, of, of bugs that could cause it is uh, vast. And what makes things worse for the diagnosis of meningitis, and what I think is really important for patients is, the diagnosis can be late. It can be torrid, it can be complex. There can be long periods of time, sometimes days or even weeks, where no one, none of the doctors seem to know what, what's going on. And it's in part because uh, we tell or train up our students that people with meningitis have neck stiffness and headache, and uh, they can't uh, stand the light. Um, and also they'll have a fever or maybe altered consciousness, and they have these particular signs we look for. But we've known for a while, at least in, in children and adolescents, that this is nonsense. This triad of meningitis, so those three features together, actually, if you wait for the patient to have all of those symptoms, you're waiting quite late on, hours and hours into the, the illness. And of course, this is a disease where we know hours make a difference. Um, and in fact, even when you wait 38 hours, not all patients will have all three of the symptoms. So um, doing some, some of the work that's um, outlined in that, that Lancet infectious diseases paper that I, I showed there, um, we, uh, we looked at these patients, everyone that came in with suspected meningitis, and then those that did and those that didn't have meningitis, and actually neck stiffness, fever, headache, and can't stand the light were as likely in either group, whether you actually turned out to have meningitis or whether actually, although the doctors thought it was meningitis, it turned out to be something else, like a, a stroke or a migraine, for example. And we also tell junior doctors that patients, if you try and straighten their leg, it hurts them and it's stiff. And if you lift up their head, their legs come up. And these are called Koenig's and Brzezinski's signs that we do on patients. But when we looked at patients who had meningitis and patients who didn't have meningitis, they were just the same between the two groups. These historical signs that we use are rubbish. 
And I've been working for the last nine years uh, in Zambia and Mozambique. And by the time someone gets from the rural village to the city hospital, yes, the meningitis can be uh, so severe that they have these signs, but actually in, in a kind of developed world, high income country context, um, these, these signs that are in the textbooks are rubbish. Um, and we've really moved away from them now. And I'm really pleased to say that in 2018, um, the, we produced a series of national guidelines from the Association of British Neurologists and with support from the um, MRF, um, which, have, which build on the fact that this classic triad is only seen in one in 10 people, even if it's bacterial meningitis, probably in no one if it's viral meningitis. But if you move away from the triad and think about the quadrad, so headache, fever, neck stiffness, and alterations in consciousness, in a, in a, uh, a study from the Netherlands, 95% of patients had at least two, and in our UK populations, 83% uh, of those with bacterial and 76% of those with viral meningitis had at least two of those four symptoms when they hit the front door in the A&E. So we really changed our teaching, which we hope will get diagnoses earlier. Another thing that can be really traumatic for patients that I see once they've recovered from meningitis is the doctors didn't find the bug. They know I have meningitis, but they don't know what it was. And that makes it often even harder to deal with the consequences. Um, and this is because um, the longer we wait after starting antibiotics to performing the lumbar puncture, the more likely the antibiotics make the CSF sterile and you can't actually grow the bug. Um, and now we've got these kind of DNA tests. You would have heard about PCR for COVID, which what it does is it amplifies DNA. Um, and often this is positive, even when the, uh, the, the we can't find a bug by culturing it, but this may tell us what the bug is, but it doesn't tell us anything about whether or not the bug is sensitive to the antibiotics the patient's getting. So now you've got a combination of a patient who had a delayed diagnosis, um, had all the uncertainty. They now say that I've got meningitis, but they don't know what type. They don't necessarily know if it's a virus or a bacteria, or even if they can find the bug, they don't know whether the bug is gonna to respond to the antibiotics I'm on, which leads to even more anxiety, understandably, at the time of illness. And then one of the questions I often get asked in clinic after people have recovered is, well, why me? And of course, the root of infection can be very varied too. Some people can have the bug in the blood and then it spills over and crosses into the, into the uh, meninges. Some people can have the bug in the ear or the sinuses and it spreads into the brain. Some people get the bug because they maybe they've got some tubing in uh, or they've had chemotherapy or the doctors have done something else. And that means that there's a cause for where an infection might get in or they're vulnerable. But in many patients, we actually don't always know. And the same is true of viruses. Sometimes they can be in the blood and cross and, and affect the meninges. Sometimes they can actually crawl up uh, inside nerves themselves, uh, or they can enter occasionally in trauma or neurosurgery. But for most cases, we don't know why. There are small clusters of families where lots of people have had meningitis, and actually we can find that there's a genetic uh, change in their, their, their immune system's ability to see bugs. But for the, for the vast majority of people, we can't provide a sensible explanation for why this has happened, uh, which further leads to um, uh, quandaries and, and feelings of vulnerability uh, uh, that, that my patients often express. And even beyond all the pathogens, we, we have to think about actually drugs and chemotherapy and other immune systems outside of the brain uh, can cause meningitis. So it's, it's even more complicated and we, we don't, unless the patient's managed excellently during that acute phase when they're in hospital, uh, we can be left with a great many unanswered questions about what the cause of the meningitis was. Um, to give you just some sense of what this looks like, if, if you screen 2000 plus patients who hit the A&E department that look like they might, not, they might be meningitis, there'll be 1000-ish who look like probable meningitis, but it actually boils down to 638 patients who actually do have meningitis. That's 638 of 2,000. So doctors have to test one in four, uh, uh, you know, four times the number of people to find uh, patients with meningitis. And when they do look at this long range of different viruses, different bacteria, different fungi, and as I mentioned, some non-infectious causes of uh, what can look like meningitis. Um, and uh, many times the diagnosis is delayed also because doctors don't appreciate quite how common meningitis is. And this is an epidemiological study where uh, if you look at uh, the, the viruses that can cause meningitis, it accounts for between 100 or uh, 800 cases 
uh, in the UK per year. Uh, and um, the, sorry, the total being 1,389. Uh, and similarly with the bacterial causes, um, it counts for 631. So these are relatively common uh, conditions uh, and, and can be uh, misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. So coming on now to the consequences, well, this is something called the uh, uh, equal 5D, which is basically it measures five domains of quality of life. So it measures uh, mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety, and depression. And if you look at people that have recovered from bacterial meningitis, enteroviral meningitis, a herpes simplex, the cold sore virus, or varicella zoster, the chickenpox virus, meningitis, even many weeks after they've been discharged from hospital, up to 48 weeks later, we went in this study. Pretty much throughout all time points uh, and across all domains, patients score a lower quality of life uh, than would be expected for the same age group uh, in the UK population, even though that UK population will, will still have symptoms. And, you know, where to go for, for wanting to know what the after effects are? Well, it's speaking to our patients, it's hearing stories like we've just heard. And it's, of course, going to experts like the Meningitis Research Foundation, who list on their website memory loss, lack of concentration, difficulty retaining information, clumsiness, headaches, deafness, tinnitus, epilepsy and seizures, weakness, spasms, speech problems, and vision problems. And when you look at this list, not all of them, but many of them uh, share symptoms with what we see in patients with migraine who complain of head pains, nausea, sensitivities, fatigue, dizziness, visual effects, vomiting, brain fog, uh, and other things. Um, and when we think about why this might be, this is try not to bore you with the pathophysiology, but basically these are the cranial nerves. This is looking at the base of the brain. Uh, and when you get meningitis, you get inflammation around this sac around the brain and around the cranial nerves, which can affect vision, as we've heard, can affect hearing and balance. Um, but it also, uh, a lesser reported symptom is the fact that this cranial nerve here, number five, is called the trigeminal nerve. Now, the job of the trigeminal nerve, as all the medical students are taught, is it comes out here and it has three divisions that go off that supply sensation primarily to the three parts of your face. But what, what people talk about uh, a lot too uh, infrequently is actually the nerve goes back on itself. It doesn't just go out to the face, it goes back on itself and it goes up and it, it provides nerve supply to the meninges. So uh, when people have uh, meningitis, there's irritation of the meninges and irritation of this nerve. And it's no surprise that some of the symptoms can be similar, but amplified because when the sensations come in that are abnormal, be they pain, uh, fatigue or other symptoms, they actually go up through an area of the brain called the thalamus, which is like a big spaghetti junction relay center, which can amplify these signals and send them up to the cerebral cortex uh, where they are experienced uh, as pain uh, and other symptoms. So what can we do to help? Well, um, there's lots of things, lots and lots of complications, but just because I'm a neurologist, I, I will focus on the, the headache, fatigue, the migraine-like symptoms, although I'm not saying it's migraine, but the migraine-like symptoms seem to respond actually to the things that we would do for migraine. And it's really the biopsychosocial model of health. So the lifestyle things that we do are a good hydration, no caffeine, no, uh, no fluctuations in blood sugar, no fluctuations in sleep hormone um, and addressing restless leg syndrome where it exists. Addressing mental health, which ranges from some people that benefit from things like Pilates and yoga through to meditation counseling uh, and, and psychological help as well from a professional. Uh, and then in terms of the pharmacologic or the biologic aspect, uh, we have treatments for the acute attacks, uh, which I'm happy to talk about all of this in the Q&A if you want. I have treatments for the acute attacks. We get our patients off all the painkillers which are actually causing a lot of the symptoms. You know, many people, for example, don't know that if you take paracetamol more than three or four days of the month, it causes almost all of the symptoms that we've listed. Um, and getting them on preventative treatments, and then we have injections like nerve blocks, Botox, and autoantibodies that we use. So I'll wrap up there. Um, just to say that um, we have an encephalitis MDT, but for not just for encephalitis, but also for uh, meningitis, we have a neurological infectious disease uh, clinic, and we'll see patients from anywhere in the country. It's an NHS service. Uh, run at the Walton Neuroscience Centre in the Royal Liverpool. So in conclusion, meningitis clearly has a broad spectrum of pathogens and whilst early treatment is key um, and viral are the most common now, actually this isn't always true for most of our patients in terms of that early diagnosis and treatment. That the after effects are common, severe, um, and although the pathophysiology is unclear, there's potential overlap for some of the symptoms with the pathophysiology of migraine 
and treatment is possible, but treatment needs to be holistic. Um, this is the team that do all the work uh, on COVID causing meningitis. Uh, here's all the team that do all the lab stuff, um, trying to understand in, in, in models how these infections get into the brain and how they damage the brain. Uh, here's the team that do all the brain infection and meningitis work with me in Africa. Uh, these are all the, 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 the sort of more local COVID people. Um, and just thank you for your time.